Good morning, AP US History. Uh, today what we're going to do with our screencast is we're really just going to focus on one person, Thomas Paine, and the book that he writes, or the pamphlet that he writes called Common Sense. So really this pamphlet has a pretty substantial impact on America, and really this whole era that we've been talking about that's leading up to American independence. Uh, so it's really kind of a book that changes the way people look at America and Britain, and really kind of pushes us further, even further down the road towards independence. So the first thing I want to do is just kind of take a little bit of a look at the man himself and his background. So Thomas Paine is actually not born in America. He's born in England, and he immigrates as an adult. So he comes over when all of this turmoil has kind of already started. So, you know, after the Stamp Act crisis, after this tension, the Boston Massacre, the things that the colonists are protesting against, um, Thomas Paine comes over kind of in the middle of all this, or after a lot of that stuff takes place. And he kind of gets caught up in it. And he really kind of believes in the American cause and the things that the Americans are fighting for, these ideas of rights um, and actual representation, and a lot of the things that we've been discussing in class. So he writes this pamphlet called Common Sense. And in a lot of ways, it's really like a political manifesto about America's place in the world and kind of uh, trying to convince people of America's cause and the fact that you know it's time to leave the British Empire and to break away from uh, Britain. So before we kind of jump into what the book is all about and the actual context of the book, I just want to kind of put it into perspective for you guys the significance of the book. So the year I want you to take a look at in this graph is 1790. So it's very difficult to get numbers for the colonial period. So for 1776, we really can't find exact numbers. But 1790 is the first census that's done in the United States. So if you look at the U.S. total population, there's about 4 million people living in the United States in 1790. So 1776, the population is probably very similar, a little bit less. Um, so what you should do is kind of take out the slave population. If you take out the slave population of about 700,000, roughly you're left with about 3 million, 3 million 200,000 people. So I want you guys to keep that figure in mind when we talk about how many people actually bought and read this book, Common Sense. Because it's just incredible. If you really kind of put it into raw numbers in the context, um, it really is revolutionary. So when we look at it, about 500,000 copies were sold before they wrote the Declaration of Independence. So I believe in your book they give the figure of about 300,000, which is true for like the first couple of months. So that equates to about 16% of the United States population at the time. So an incredible amount. So to kind of, there's a couple things that you should be thinking about. So 16% of the U.S. population is reading this book. So the first thing that kind of pops into my head is, well, that also shows you something about American society. It tells you a lot about American society, actually. So first thing it tells you is that there's a really high literacy rate in America. So New England... Historians estimate that they have about a 95% male literacy rate. Um, women throughout the colonies about a 60% literacy rate. So Americans can read, and not just the elite people. You know, the average common person can read, does pick up a newspaper, they do read these pamphlets, and they're interested in it. Reading is not seen as an elitist activity in America. It's seen as the common person does it, which is very, very different from Europe. You know, only wealthy, aristocratic people have leisure time to read. In America, it's much more of a, of a democratic view of reading, of kind of cutting across class lines. And so they do kind of get influenced by these newspapers. And they do kind of read about, you know, the different acts that are being passed and the political viewpoints that are going on here. Um, so that's very important, I think, to understand about the American colonies and the characteristics of Americans at the time. Now... When you, let's compare it to a few different things. Because um, 16% of the population reads this book. So if, you, if you're familiar with the, the music industry, you know, if a really successful artist, they can sell, they call, if they sell enough copies, they get what's called a gold album or a platinum album or a diamond album. So just take a second and look at these figures. If you sell, a, if, you sell if your album is considered a gold album, you're only selling it to less than 1% of the American population. Same thing with the Platinum album, because you have to kind of put it in context, right? 500,000, but there's 350 million Americans now. There's only 3, 3 million Americans that are eligible to kind of read Thomas Paine's Common Sense. 
So there's just no comparison. You know, if you get the highest one that you can, a diamond album, 10 million people buy your your album as a as a musician. That's only that's almost that's only three percent of the American population. Sixteen percent are going to read his pamphlet. Rivals it in our modern world is the amount of people who watch the Super Bowl is about equivalent. About you get about 40, 50 million people who watch the Super Bowl each year, and that's about the equivalent of people who are reading Thomas Paine's Common Sense. If you really break the raw numbers down, out of that three million people, half of them are women. So you have about 1.5 million men. If you take that down, you break it down even further, a good percentage of those people are children. So maybe there's about a million men, free men, in America at the time. That basically means that one out of every two men in the country read Thomas Paine's Common Sense. So when we say people are reading it, we mean basically literally everybody in the colonies has read this book. And it plays a big role on the way they view their relationship to England. So what is his big thesis here? Well, the big thesis of common sense, um, why he calls it common sense, is he believes it's common sense for America, for the American colonies to be their own country and to break away um, from England. And so he's one of the first people that puts this idea, this thesis out there, this really like, well, no, let's not try and reconcile with the British. It's over. It's time for America to be its own country. And he lays out a lot of arguments for why he thinks America should be its own country. You know, the geographic distance, the wealth that the country generates, the political ideas of the nation that developed on their own. And he really feels like it's just impractical, impractic, impractical. You know, why should this small little island thousands of miles away control the United States, what becomes the United States or the American colonies. To him, and increasingly to a lot of Americans, it simply makes no sense. Uh, and the more the tension increases with the Coercive Act and the Intolerable Act, and then when real violence breaks out at Bunker Hill and, you know, up in Boston, more Americans are going to kind of get on board with this idea that, yes, America should be its own country. We have our own traditions our own way of life, and it's time to break with Britain. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a few excerpts from Common Sense. So what I would do if I was you is for each excerpt, there's going to be three excerpts, I would just pause the video now, read the excerpt, and then kind of jump back in when uh, I start to explain a little bit. So for this, for this excerpt here, really I think that this, this is interesting. I chose this one because I think it really correlates to what's going on now in our government. If you look at it in what he's talking about, leaving a debt for the next generation, I think a lot of this argument could definitely be made today about the way that our government is functioning as far as a country and leaving problems for their children. He's basically saying you have to fix these issues now. If you don't kind of fix these issues with Britain, um, they're denying of our rights. Look at the position you're leaving your children in. You're leaving your children in a worse position than you were in. And so I think that definitely kind of rings true for our country today in a lot of ways. Okay, so the second idea here I think is really an interesting idea. And it's something that the Founding Fathers really pretty much all agree with. They kind of look at government as a necessary evil. And they, they're going to choose democracy, or more specifically a republic, as the best form of government. But they recognize that no type of government is perfect, and it's impossible for a government to be perfect. And so it's just the least evil of the types of governments you can have is a republic, because it gives the people the most choice and the most say in it. But that doesn't mean that a republic is going to work smoothly and it's going to be perfect all the time. And that's why they built so many things into our, our founding documents, into eventually the Constitution uh, and state governments, because they knew that given the chance, governments will abuse their power. And so what Thomas Paine is saying here is that you know, the government in England is not even you know, a tolerable one. It's this evil type of government that has lost its way and it's just totally abusing its power. It's lost its, its checks and balances. Uh, and so the Americans definitely kind of take this lesson and when they create their government, they try and build in a system where something that was happening in England to them with, with the British Empire could not happen in the United States. That's what they try to do. Alright, so for this last 
excerpt that we're going to take a look at. Um, I really think that Thomas Paine tries to put America as this leading place in the world. And a lot of Americans afterwards will kind of take on the same, same beliefs, that America kind of led the world as far as breaking away and trying to form the first society that had sound democratic principles, a republic, which guaranteed rights. And really, you know, as Americans, we often don't kind of put it in the right context. If you look at America in comparison to the rest of the world, when we have our revolution to kind of instill these values into society, we really are one of a kind. We're the first country to try and do this. And we set off a wave of revolution. You know, it's known as the era of revolution for a reason. We set off the French Revolution and these Latin American revolutions. There's a lot of reason that, you know, we're kind of influential in, in causing a lot of these things to take place. And so I think Thomas Paine trying to make that argument here that, you know, the cause of America is not just relegated to America. It's a bigger cause. It's the cause of humankind here to try and gain your rights um, and to gain your rightful place as far as influence in the government and the, the protection that you deserve as just as a simple as a person. All right, guys. Um, so good luck with your uh, Declaration of Independence assignment, and I will see you guys in class on Tuesday.